promise you that. But uh, anyhow, uh, I'm glad I brought him with me. He lives in my heart. Uh, he indwells me, and he does you if you're saved tonight. Amen. Uh, so he goes everywhere you go, whether you realize it or not. Uh, but uh, I'm grateful for that. Uh, anybody got a quick word on your heart before I open the scripture tonight? Anybody just want to brag on the Lord? Anybody? All right. Mark's Gospel, chapter 7. We're going to be in verse 30 through verse 37. And uh, there's a little phrase there that we'll look at in just a moment and as we read uh, that I've entitled the message. Uh, and we know that um, Jesus is pretty much moving back and forth. Uh, several times we know that they've crossed the Sea of Galilee. Uh, we know that they've gone uh, now uh, into the borders of Tyre and Sidon. Uh, verse 24 tells us, uh, and he experiences a lady there who had a daughter with an unclean spirit. She heard of him and tried to do everything she could to get uh, him to touch her daughter. This woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician, uh, and she began to uh, plead that he would cast that devil out of her daughter. And uh, we know that uh, we see Jesus now moving and ministering uh, to the Gentile. Uh, and then we pick up and we begin reading in verse 31. It said, And again, departing from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, he came under the Sea of Galilee through the midst of the coast of Decapolis. And they bring unto him one that was deaf and had an impediment in his speech. And they beseech him to put his hand upon him. And he took him aside from the multitude and he put his fingers into his ears and he spit and touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and saith unto him, Apapatha, that is, be opened. And straightway his ears were opened and the string of his tongue was loosed and he spake plain. And he charged them that they should tell no man, but the more he charged them, so much the more a great deal they published it. And were, and were beyond measure astonished, saying, He hath done all things well. He maketh both the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. Pray with me. Father, thank you again tonight, uh, Lord, for uh, the opportunity to hear music, Lord, to hear a song, and Lord, to pray and and come together as God's people. And Lord, I realize we could have uh, chosen to be anywhere else, but we've chosen to be here, Lord, uh, to sit at the Master's table and to be fed from the Word of God. And Lord, I pray, Father, tonight that we'd find that that we need, Lord, to replenish us and encourage us, Lord, in the days in which we live. Lord, I pray, Lord, you'd speak to our hearts tonight from this passage of Scripture. Lord, say what you want to say, and may we respond in the way that you'd want us to respond. We love you. We praise you now, Father. Illuminate our minds to see and understand what is in this text. In Christ's name, amen. Most scholars say that uh, Jesus took his disciples on this journey, which actually took about eight months uh, in, to some into this place of in-depth teaching. Uh, and if you go back, if you'll notice in Mark chapter 5, if you'll pay attention to that, if you remember, um, we find that Jesus come over to the other side of the sea of the uh, country of the Gadarenes. And as he experienced that demoniac there, uh, notice verse 20 of chapter 5 says, And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. Now he's speaking to this man, Legion, who has been, de been delivered from this... Uh, these demons, uh, he's been delivered by the marvelous grace of God, and now he's gone, and he, he goes, Jesus allowed him, wouldn't allow him to go with him, but he said unto him in verse 19 in chapter 5, he says, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. So he did just that. Verse 20 tells us in the fifth chapter, he departed and he went, began to uh, publish in the capitalists uh, the great things that God did for him and all men did marvel. Uh, so understanding that, this legion, this former demoniac, uh, began to publish in the capitalists the great things that Jesus has done for him 
And as the scripture says, all men did marvel. They were amazed. It blew their minds as they began to see him. Now as you understand that, uh, going into this text, folks, there's nothing that makes an impression on the lives of others than that of a testimony of a changed life. The reason this demoniac had uh, such an impression on the, the other people's lives was because of what he's experienced. He, uh, remember who he was. It's obvious when everyone saw this man who once ran naked uh, in the graveyard, screaming and yelling, cutting himself. Uh, the Bible says in the fifth chapter, now he's clothed and in his right mind. And he wants to do the ministry. He's interested in others. And Jesus says, listen, I want you to reach those in Decapolis. These people were impacted by the impact that Jesus had upon his life. Now that leads us back to the seventh chapter. Jesus, once again, uh, there's a lapse between chapter 5 and chapter 7 where we're at right now. There's a lapse of about eight months according to most biblical scholars. And if you do a timeline of the study of the New History, uh, excuse me, the New Testament. So in these eight months... Uh, we find uh, that's what he's doing, teaching these men. But then we come to this gentleman in this text. Uh, we've come to verse 31, and he's departed from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, and he came to the Sea of Galilee through the midst of the coast of Decapolis. And notice verse 32. Uh, we see an individual he now is going to encounter, and the focus seems to be between the encounter of this man and Jesus. Well, at, the Bible says, and they bring unto him one that was deaf, and he had an impediment, a handicap, uh, uh, in his speech. And they beseech him to put his hand upon him. I want you to notice, first of all, we learn from the fifth chapter uh, that no man is beyond his power and control. We see that through the demoniac. But now we also see it once again, uh, we see it once again in this man's life. Keep in mind, the scripture says that he is deaf, verse 32, and evidently he has an impediment of speech, which most of the time you know as well as I do that many people who are deaf, sometimes they have a speech uh, impediment. But there's interesting wordplay here. You might not see it, but as you dig, it says that he's deaf and he's dumb. The word deaf here in the context of this scripture, uh, it means to be blunt or dull. In other words, relating to a past injury. Somewhere along the way, this man's hearing has been injured. And the injury to his hearing has caused him an impediment in his speech. Now, our Lord has a, I believe with all my heart, the Lord has a special interest in those who have physical handicaps and special needs. There's nothing that will impact your life like somebody that has a handicap, somebody that uh, has met the misfortunes of life, somebody may that have been born with an infirmity, uh, somebody that may experience tragedy in their life and they're handicapped for some reason. I I'd say as I look around, there are several people I've met through the years uh, that are just phenomenal speakers and they just have such a, a glow and anointing of God on them uh, because of things that they've experienced. Uh, many of you know evangelist David Ring with cerebral palsy. There's no Nobody that's impacted uh, the world like he has with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, and one of his favorite messages I, I think that I enjoyed is thou shalt not whine. And he talked about whining church members. And he said, listen, look at me. I don't have anything to whine about. I thought about a, a, a Jesse Crooks. Many of you know him. Uh, lives over in Thomasville. Uh, at one time, he was uh, traveling all over the state of North Carolina. Went to prisons and different places. Hard to understand as he had uh, some strokes and other medical disabilities. But I, I could go on and on with different people I've met at different places that just had, just had something about them. They didn't let that physical uh, handicap or that special need uh, limit them. And you and I have people... We have some folks in our church that work with uh, special needs and physical handicapped people and it takes a special person to work with those people. But there's just something about those people that, that seem to be a magnet and they draw us and they draw us to help us realize how fortunate we are. But at the same time, you see, I thought about this and you know, a lot of people get excited when somebody famous comes to their town. But you know, when Jesus came to town, have you noticed already, what we, have we studied the scriptures? Have you noticed when Jesus came to town, the blind, the deaf, the lame, the leper, and those who had incurable diseases, they got excited, didn't they? 
They knew that Jesus was their only hope. Uh, that's why they would take and they laid the man at, at the pool of Bethesda because they knew that Jesus was coming by. And, and we could go on and on through the scriptures and we can see so many accounts and encounters between those who are lame and have leper, uh, leprosy and deaf and blind that Jesus impacted their lives. And he used their healings many times to display a message to those who weren't handicapped. Well, the man's condition is very important. This man shows us once again as we study this book that no man is beyond his power and his control over their lives. Well, let's look at the master's cure. We see his, the man's condition, but look at the master's cure. Notice in verse 32 before we get to it, notice, and they bring him unto him one that was deaf. And he took him, verse 33, aside from the multitude and put his fingers into his ears and he spit and touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said unto him, Apathetha, that is, be opened. Uh, you can't help but to ignore as you look at the master's cure here. Uh, first of all, I want you to know this healing is a little different. Uh, we see the tenderness of Jesus. He, he, notice verse 33 says, And he took him aside from the multitude. Now, one of the unique healings in the Bible, Jesus normally didn't do that. But he did this gentleman. He took him aside and he showed a special interest. Uh, he, he drew him aside. Uh, we don't know all the reasons behind that. Uh, maybe he might have been embarrassed. Uh, we, we don't know the conclusion of all of it. But there's one thing I do see. Uh, is I see Jesus taking him aside from the multitude. He gets him out of the crowd and he deals with him one-on-one. -on -one. I don't know about you, but I'm glad for the tenderness of Jesus. You see, I'm glad that there's been some times in my life when there was sin and there was rebellion and there was things in my life that shouldn't be there. Uh, listen, and I needed a cure and I needed to hear from heaven and I needed him to do something in my life and I'm glad that he pulled me tenderly aside and, and he dealt with my issues without embarrassing me. Aren't you? The tenderness of Jesus. There's nothing like the tenderness of Jesus, but look at the touch of Jesus. And he put his fingers into his ears and he spit. Now, most folks say, well, that's gross. Well, it's the scripture. <laughs> and you can get a whole lot of different ideas about that particular verse. I assure you, I read some far out stuff and all the different guys that had reasons they thought he spit. But anyhow... Uh, and he spit and he touched his tongue. Now in our day, most of us, <laughs> we, wouldn't want, we wouldn't care too much for that, would we? But what's this all about? You know what Jesus was doing with this deaf and dumb man? He had to go to the source of the problem. He had to go to the source of his problem. It was his hearing and it was his speech. He had to, he had to touch the, the issues that he faced. You see, Jesus, what's he doing here? Jesus made a connection with this man, reminding us that we too have to make a connection with people. If we're going to minister to them, we've got to make a connection with them. If we want to help people, we've got to touch them in their need. Uh, God never intended for us to isolate ourselves totally from the world. He's caused us to impact the world not to isolate ourselves. And that's one of the things that's been so hard about COVID uh, for Christians and, and for, or for the church is we've been in a place where we've had to isolate ourselves from the world. He's never called us to do that. And that's why that's been so difficult because He's called us to reach a world that's lost and dying, a world, listen, that needs His touch. You know, somebody, I wrote this poem down. It said, some want a church with a steeple and a bell. Give me a mission at the gates of hell. <laughs> I like that. Folks, that's where we're sitting right now in our culture. Every day that you live, down at the workplace and over to school, everywhere you go today, we have, a, we have a generation that's so godless. And every day, we're literally sitting at the gates of hell with the people we rub shoulders with. And, and we need to be mindful that God's called us to reach out and touch this world. So we see the touch of Jesus. He made a connection with this man. And it reminds us that we have to make a connection with people in their handicap. He looked up to heaven and he sighed and he said unto him, Apapatha, that is, be opened. Now notice the groan of Jesus. Verse 34 and verse 35. 
Uh, let's look at the groan of Jesus. Notice something interesting here. Uh, the Bible says, in looking up to heaven, he sighed. Uh, you might read through that quickly and miss that. Okay, why? What, what's this all about? What, what, if, you, if, if this sigh was a sigh of compassion, uh, you see, Jesus sympathized with people in their need, and he still sympathizes with people in their need. You see, the man couldn't hear his sigh. Remember, he's deaf. He couldn't hear his sigh, but he could see his face, couldn't he? Are you with me? You see, folks, the closer we get to God, the more aware we are of the needs of people. And Jesus was aware. Straightway, his ears opened, verse 35 says, they were open, and the string of his tongue was loosed, and he spake plain. But Jesus spoke, and that word apapatha meant really be opened. And he opened whatever it was that was blocking his hearing and his tongue. He loosed his tongue, and he has the ability now uh, and, and to be effective in everyday life, which once he wasn't. You see, this man, he couldn't hear his sigh, but he could see his face. And the closer we get to God, the more aware we are of the needs of people. You see, folks, the secret of compassion is communion with God. That's what he's showing us in this encounter. You know, there's a song out you might hear sometimes on Joy FM now. I don't know all the lyrics to it, but it says, When you can't see his face, trust his heart. And that's so true. Sometimes you're going to be in situations in life, you, don't, you can't always see his face. You can't always see his face, but you can trust his heart. I thought about what Isaiah said as I thought about this experience. Uh, reminded as we think about uh, about the groan of Jesus. Isaiah said he was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and uh, looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrow. Maybe, is that why he signed? He's taking on the, that burden of that gentleman. He's taking on the sorrow that was weighing this man down. That's why he sighed. He, he, Isaiah said, And we thought his troubles were a punishment for God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. We've left God's, we've turned our own way. Uh, the New Living Translation says, we've left God's path to follow our own, yet the Lord laid on him the iniquity of sin on us all. Remember Hebrews 4.15? He, writer of Hebrews says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin, speaking of Jesus. So as you think about that, uh, could that be why he sighed? Uh, he sighed over uh, a sigh of compassion. And thank God one day, uh, as, he's, as he was there on Calvary's hill and he gave up the ghost, there probably was a sigh of compassion when he probably said, It is finished. It was completed. He had done everything God the Father asked him to do to cover the sins of man. Well, as we read on, look at the Master's charge. Verse 36, and he charged them, okay, those that had brought this man, uh, this deaf man to Jesus, he charged them that they should tell no man. But the more he charged them, so much the more a great deal they published it. They, got, they, they, went, they began to broadcast that. They began to make it known. You, you couldn't keep them quiet. But Jesus wasn't interested in public acclaim. That's why He continually told people to go tell no one. He wasn't interested in public acclaim or applause. He only wanted to do His Father's will. That's why He kept telling them. He was interested in the Father's timing. He wasn't looking for a public office. He wasn't looking to be lifted up the way they wanted to be lifted up. He, he was going to be lifted up in another way for the whole world to see him dying for the sins of men. He told them not to tell and they couldn't tell enough. Folks, he's told us to go tell and we don't. The master's charge. Well, let's look though in verse 37 at the multitude's confession. The Bible says they begin to publish it more a great deal and were beyond measure astonished 
saying, He hath done all things well. He maketh both the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. Look at their confession. One sentence, okay? But there's some depth in it, okay? He hath done all things well. They were astonished at what they were seeing him do uh, in, in people's lives. Remember now, he's ministering to the Gentiles. He's pretty much been focused on the Jews, but now he's, he's in Gentile territory. And they begin to be astonished. You see, uh, they, one translation says they praised the God of Israel for what he was doing. This little phrase, uh, you see, they were completely amazed. And the text literally says they were completely amazed and they said again and again, everything he does is wonderful. He even makes the deaf to hear and he gives speech to those who cannot speak. That's what it literally reads in the Greek. Aren't you glad tonight as you think about Romans 8, 28? And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. You know, I thought about this, and I, I pretty much concluded everything. And, and these, somebody said that these, word, these six words, He hath done all things well, are six words that carry us into uncertain days. And that could be true. When we face uncertain times in our lives, we have to reflect and remember that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. These six words will carry us through the uncertainties of life, the uncertain days that we face. But as you think about that word for just a moment, I I'd already concluded my conclusion and everything, and I went back and I got to thinking about that word. He hath done all things well. Exactly what does that word well mean? Well, I began to do a little research and I thought, I want to know more about what, he, what he's saying. That word well, it really mean, it means to, is to be beyond one's depth. Stay with me. To be beyond one's depth or out of one's depth or over one's head. You see, that's exactly who we were without Christ. We may not have been deaf or dumb, but we were spiritually lost. You see, we were over our head in trouble because of sin. We were over our head. Uh, we, were, we were out of one's debt. We were swimming in waters that we could not tread. We were in a situation, listen, uh, we had the wrath of God over our head and there was no way out from under it. But thank God that God sent His Son to die on a cross and now that we're, uh, we're right, we've risen above all those circumstances. And then I got excited about that and I went a little farther. <laughs> And I begin to look at that little word well. Uh, it, it means he hath done all things. He hath done things in my life and your life. He's done some things with some groundwork. Think back for just a moment at the, at the strategic times in your life and my life when he laid the groundwork. Hey, he laid the groundwork for me to be raised in a, in a place where the Bible was preached and taught. He laid the groundwork for me to be raised where somebody would take me to church. He laid the groundwork for me uh, to hear to be taken to Bible school. He laid the groundwork for me to hear the gospel on a Sunday night and give my heart and life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he laid the groundwork for God to interrupt my life and, and call me to to preach the gospel. He, he laid the groundwork of laying everything out for me to move from uh, Caldwell County to Stanley County. And he laid the groundwork in every single step that I've taken. And guess what? If you allow him to lay the groundwork for you, he'll do it. He hath done all things well. Stop and think about just a moment where you've been and what you've done, the people you've met, and think for just a moment how he's laid the groundwork in your life to get you where you are now. That's exactly what he's doing for the disciples. Listen, he's laying the groundwork. He's taking the gospel now uh, to the, to, from the Jew to the Gentile. Uh, listen, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, uh, they're more interested about their rules and regulations and, and they're ignoring him and they're doing everything they can to ridicule him and ruin him. But at the same time, he's facing all that and he's reaching the world for Jesus Christ. And if he can do it, you and I can do it with his power on our lives. It means with groundwork. It, 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 it means as a catalyst. It, it means with support. He has done all things with support. He has done all, he has done all things with influence. I don't know about you, 
Boy, I'm sure glad God's got influence in my life. I'd be in a mess right now. I don't know about you. If He wasn't influencing me through the power of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, I'd be in a mess and I guarantee you would be too tonight. Amen. It means, and here it is, this word, He hath done all things well. He hath done all things in a productive way. <laughs> Think about it for just a moment. He's done some things in your life and my life in a productive way. You see, there's some times just like this deaf man. This man who had, was deaf and, and had a speech problem because of probably an injury. He took him aside from the multitude. And he laid some groundwork. He laid some groundwork. He began, you know what he did? In a productive way, he either confronted me or he chastened me to get back where I needed to be and let him work in through my life. Have you been there? I have. And if you haven't yet, you probably will be, I assure you. But as I come to narrow in just for a moment to a conclusion, as I journey back to that fifth chapter and I think about Legion for just a moment, you see, Jesus has gone back after eight months to this same area in Decapolis where he's been left there to minister. I can't help but to believe that this man's family and his friends had heard the testimony of Legion and they said, we've seen what he did for Legion. You remember old Legion? He was over there in the graveyard running naked, cutting himself. His family and friends wouldn't have nothing to do with him. But you remember, he was chained in fetters. And listen, the power of God had changed his life. Jesus touched him and cast those demons out. And, and he's... He, He's, it was clothed in his right mind, and now he's, he's telling others about Jesus. His family loves God. Do you, can you not remember him? You see, they said, or they thought, surely, <laughs> if we can just get our friend of Jesus, if, if he helped Legion like that, surely he can help our friend. If he has the power to change that man's life and do for him what he did, what he did in and through his life, he has the power to help our friend who can't speak and he can't hear. You know, don't ever underestimate the power of one man or woman that's yielded to Jesus Christ. This man named Legion is changing people's lives through God's help and grace. Now here's the question we've got to ask ourselves tonight as we look at this scripture and we challenge ourselves. Is there anybody that you know in your life, in your everyday workplace, family, friends, acquaintances, is there anybody that you know that's deaf and dumb to the gospel of Jesus Christ? You see, God didn't call us to put our fingers in their ears or, or, or uh, spit and put it on their tongue. He didn't call us to do that. All He did, He's called us simply to tell them what Jesus has done for us. To tell them about the groundwork. To be a catalyst. Uh, to support them. To influence them in a productive way. Helping them understand that one day we were, we were beyond our depth. We were out of debt. We were covered in sin and we were going down. And listen, our Savior reached down and lifted us up out of the miry clay and set our feet on solid rock. That's the message of this little paragraph in the Scripture. Do we do that? You see, He challenged them. He told them not to tell and they couldn't tell enough. But He's told us to go tell. Will we? Will we? I believe the first way that we tell people, first of all, is with our life. And then the second way, I believe, is we tell people with our lips. When's the last time? I know COVID's impacted us, but things are lifting up just a little bit. It's getting a little better. Let me challenge you to invite somebody to the house of God. Invite somebody to come and worship. Invite somebody that you know that's living in a troubled time of their life. And let them see.